Hello and welcome to Let's Talk, a series of podcasts produced by the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation on the issues that matter to us, the issues that we know matter to you too. Substance use prevention, research, treatment of addiction, recovery management, advocacy, and education. I'm your host, William Moyers, and today I'm joined by my longtime colleague, Janelle Weslow. Welcome, Janelle. Thank you. You're the Vice President of Clinical Excellence, Innovation, and Recovery Management. That's a long title. It is. What does that mean? Oh, it means so many different things. We'll start with the clinical innovation part of it. This is our efforts to make sure we're providing the very best possible care for the patients that come to us, counting on us to not only pull them out of the disease of addiction and clinically manage their illness, but also to move them into self-management where they have the right tools and the right support so they can have a successful, happy life and recovery long after they leave us and leave treatment. And the reason for that is because we, for a long time, particularly to say when I went to treatment 30 years ago at Hazel, and um, it was all about the acuity. We recognized the acuity of the illness, but we moved away from that. Explain more about the fact that it's not just the acuity anymore. Uh, well, how we look at it now is about how long we can stay engaged with somebody. Uh, engaged. So it's important that we address the acuity when someone comes to us. They may need detox. They may need very intensive residential care. But as they start to get better medically and spiritually and with their mental health and all the holistic pieces that, that uh, build together to form their clinical picture, they start to need less of our clinical management. They don't need us every day to be checking their blood pressure or to be in group three times a day. Mm -hmm. They start to get to the point where they need a little less of that. So we start moving them into the next level of care where they have less, uh, less clinical management and start to learn how to do things on their own. So they start to learn how to find support in the community, find medical providers in the community that understand their illness and can support them in the right way. So as we start engaging people longer and moving them down that chain of acuity to where they're managing that on their own, we still want to provide some lifelines or safety nets for them along the way. because. What we found through research and just through working with thousands of people is that as you move into recovery, there's certain pitfalls that pop up at certain times throughout, sure. that, throughout that life cycle. Mm -hmm. And having the right support and the right tools in place um, at those times can prevent them having to come back into that very intensive level of care like residential or detox, but to help them get back on track quickly and at a lower level of care so they can get back into their lives and self-management right away. Because we know addiction, substance use disorder, uh, is a chronic illness, which means it can't be cured, but it can be treated and people who have it can manage it, right? And we've got to give them those tools. Correct. Just like any other chronic illness, uh, uh, the substance use disorder field is really starting to realize how important it is to provide ongoing case management, ongoing support, ongoing tools, recovery checkups, just like you'd have for any other chronic illness. Looking at what are the vital signs that we would um, utilize during care and after, after treatment ends to help people stay on track or to get them back on track quicker so their lives are not as interrupted, the loved ones around them aren't as interrupted, and we can keep everyone on track, moving down that road to recovery and having a very happy, successful life as they, as they go year after year. And technology plays a huge role in that. We have recognized that at Hazel and Betty Ford. You've been on the cutting edge uh, for many, many years in that area of how do we harness or how do we develop technology. Talk to our listeners and our viewers today about the role that technology plays in all of this. Certainly. Uh, that comes to the innovation part of my title, which has uh, been something I've been passionate about for many, many years, but just recently has become um, formally part of my role, which is very exciting. Um, starting way back in 2006, we started to realize that we had people from all over the country coming to us for help and doing really well in treatment. But then they would go back home. And how do you stay connected with people who are all over the country and um, all different parts uh, and varying levels of motivation and varying levels of engagement? How do we stay connected with them? And we started very long ago with a program called MORE, My Ongoing Recovery Experience. It was a technology platform built specifically for people in recovery with content, videos, fact sheets, and also the ability to work with a recovery coach. Uh, at the time, they were all licensed recovery coaches, uh, a lifeline for them 
anytime they needed. And we'd proactively reach out to them at certain times and ask them, how are you doing? Is there anything we can do to help you? Is your transition from treatment to home going smoothly? If not, what can we do to make it smoother for you? Uh, it might be that they were recommended to see a psychiatrist in their home area to continue the medications that were started for depression or anxiety. And maybe that fell through where they're not taking new patients. We could case manage that, help them get a new referral to make sure that didn't become a bump in the road of, to their recovery. Is more a recovery app per se, or is it something different? Yes, and yes, it is both. So it is a platform that we utilize in our patient portal. So much like most people have a patient portal with their yes, own physician or sure. clinic, we have a patient portal that our patients use as well. So we have this wonderful platform where our patients, as they're in treatment and afterwards, can get at all these resources that are specifically built for them. Knowing how successful that was, we also at Hazel and Buddy Ford built an app that was similar to that platform uh, called Mobile More Field Guide to Life and has quite a bit of content in there as well as daily affirmations, weekly sober challenges, just really an engaging, uh, interactive app that people can utilize uh, to stay engaged and to help them feel motivated and excited about their recovery. Do you have to be a Hazel and alum to be able to access some of these technological advances that we offer? Some yes, but most no. We want to make sure that we offer these uh, support tools and technology uh, to anyone in recovery. So our mobile apps, we have so many of them that Hazel and Betty Ford has produced, but the one I was speaking about Mobile More Field Guide to Life is available to anybody, both um, um, by, with Androids or Apple or whatever platform you may have, to just go out and get it like any other app and utilize it. And it has all kinds of great content, including some videos that uh, you produced for us, William. Oh, I did? Yes. Oh, oh I guess I'm famous now or something. <laughs> Janelle, we uh, have had a podcast with Dr. Stephen DeLisi, who, of course, is um, intimately involved now in our professional education solutions. We have enormous content in our our organization. People tend to think of us as a 24 hour a day book or some of the other meditation books. How is technology, how are you harnessing technology in capturing that content and delivering it? Well, I think technology gives us this fantastic opportunity to overcome you know, typical problems that would happen because of resource constraints. You can't have a person um, you know, in every single state to try to help everybody or every single town. So when you start to use technology, you really broaden your reach. You can take this fantastic content, package it up in different ways that will fit for what the patient wants, what the person in recovery wants. And they can take those pieces that are meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And because we have these technological solutions like apps and social networks and different platforms people can, can come to, they can take what works for them. It's very patient-centered, very recovery-centered, and take what works and then move on and, and get what they need and continue in their life of recovery. So it keeps our content from being on a shelf in a book, if you think about right. way old school, um, and makes it accessible to so many more people in so many different ways. Is technology, as we apply it at Hazel and Betty Ford, just for the younger generations? There's a, sometimes a misconception that that's the case. Um, of course, our young adults and our younger folks that come to treatment um, have grown up with this technology, and to them, it's second nature. Uh, it's like writing cursive is to us, which they don't do anymore. <laughs> so uh, for them, it's it's easy. Uh, for people of my generation, we came to it a little later, but you know, grabbed onto it pretty quickly. Uh, the misconception comes from some of our older patients, which, you know, of course we have patients of all ages. And what we found is, is given the right coaching and, and a little bit of patience, and for some, not even that, because they are, they're FaceTiming their grandkids. I mean, our older generation has grabbed onto technology as a way to stay close to their family. So a lot of them have already started to bridge that gap. And with just a little bit of handholding if needed, um, some patience and some tips, most of them do just fine on the technology. Technology and, and really seem to uh, embrace it as a way for them not to feel so alone or isolated, depending on where they live and how close their family is. I'm excited by all the things that, that Hazel and Betty Ford is doing under your leadership. It spooks me a little bit because I am from the old school and, and, and even today when you walk the halls or you go onto the units, there they are, that very essence of what got us here all these 70 years ago. This is our 70th year, 1949 to 2019, and that's the 12 steps and the 12 traditions that hang on the wall of every one of those units. Have you ever felt any tension between what was birthed in the late 1930s and where we're going today? You know, most of the time that's due to misconception. 
Um, and so we're glad when people bring that to us and say, well, what about fellowship? How can people yeah. have fellowship behind a yeah. computer screen? Yeah. Um, and, the, and the fact is, if you design the solutions correctly, it can enhance that and encourage it. For example, mm. our MORE program has recovery coaches. What we found is that most people, though recommended to attend 12-step self-help groups after they leave treatment, don't necessarily just run out and do that. It's a little scary to go to your first meeting on your own. Mm -hmm. So a coach's main role in those first few calls is to really encourage and support that person and maybe even connect them with another alumni in their community to help them go to those meetings and start to get really connected in that recovery community so it's easier to disconnect from their using community, which mm -hmm. is really one of the very first critical tasks of someone going home to their home community. So what I hear you saying then is that technology will be vitally important to the future of our mission and our ability to expand our mission, but we're not going to use technology to replace the fellowship that is at that, well, the first word of the first step of the 12 steps is we. Right. And there's nothing like a meeting, there's nothing like a group experience, and technology can perhaps bring people together, but at the end of the day, it's that interaction that counts, right? Exactly, exactly. We had a great story of somebody who came to us for treatment that lived in a very rural area. It took him about two and a half hours to get it to the nearest town. Uh, so as we were building a plan for this person so he could be successful in his early recovery, he committed to going to one meeting a week in town. And that's great. That's a five hour round trip plus the meeting, hopefully some fellowship before or after. Mm -hmm. That's a big commitment, but he committed to it and he did it. In between, he supplemented that with online meetings. So he was still interacting with people in recovery, but that worked for him. You have to really take his situation and make the plan fit. If we had told him 90 meetings in 90 days, we would be setting him up to fail. Great and that's point. not what we're about. You know, that's what our clinical standards are all about. Meeting people where they're at, giving them a plan they can be successful at and that they buy into. So they'll actually go do it. And that's how we see success and better outcomes. So Janelle, you talk about innovation and technology and bringing Hazel and Betty Ford to people who can't get to Hazel and Betty Ford. Talk to us about what's happening in telehealth. What is telehealth and how is it being applied? Telehealth is such an exciting area for us and we're really poised to expand how we are utilizing it for our patients to reach people we could never reach before. It's been around for a long time, but and we've dabbled in it in different ways. Uh, currently, we're working in telehealth in three very distinct ways. One, we have a f two of our addiction psychiatrists who are seeing people via telehealth that normally would not be able to continue seeing them after they left care. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the key things for that is so difficult to find really good addiction psychiatrists that uh, the more we can um, have these great resources and, and great staff members available to our patients in such a critical need, uh, the better off. So telehealth really expands that reach. We're also using telehealth um, in one of our recovery support programs or a program that we use when people leave treatment to keep them connected. And that's our connection program, which mm -hmm. is support and monitoring after mm -hmm. treatment happens. Uh, we are now offering either that by phone, which is our traditional way, and also offering it via video visits. So if somebody would like to see us on a video screen, phone, tablet, to, uh, desktop computer, they can also choose that as well, which has been very interesting. Uh, and probably what I think one of the most exciting ways we are experimenting in telehealth is we've started to pilot a virtual intensive outpatient program to really reach people we would never be able to reach to continue on in their trajectory from less intense treatment over time uh, so they can be in their home areas and still be getting the excellent care and resources and treatment from our skilled providers in a group, getting fellowship, and as they reconnect into those recovery communities. So very exciting meeting people where they're at, expanding access to people who normally wouldn't have it, which is really a part of our mission. Once upon a time, you had to come to a Hazel and, Hazel and Betty Ford site to experience that mission or maybe get it through a book, and now we're taking that mission through your good work, through technology and all the other innovation that's occurring. We're taking it to people, as you said, where they are in that moment that they need to experience our mission. Janelle Weslow, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, William. And thank you all for joining us for another edition of Let's Talk, a series of podcasts on the issues that matter to us and matter to you. On behalf of our executive producer, Lisa Stangle, I'm your host, William Moyers, and we'll see you another time.